A Young People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, adapted by Rebecca Steffoff. Chapter 13, Class Struggle. Anger was on the rise in America as the 20th century opened. The United States had just won the Spanish-American War. Emma Goldman, an anarchist and feminist at the time, later remembered how the war in Cuba and the Philippines had filled people with patriotism. How our hearts burned with indignation against the atrocious Spaniards. But when the smoke was over, the dead buried, and the cost of the war came back to the people in an increase of price and com of commodities and rent, that is, when we sobered up from the patriotic spree. It suddenly dawned on us that the cause of the Spanish-American War was the price of sugar, and that the lives, blood, and money of the American people were used to protect the interests of capitalists. Some famous American writers spoke up for socialism with harsh words for the capitalist system. Jack London's novel, The Iron Heel, published in 1906, offered a vision of a, of a socialist brotherhood of man. The same year, Upton Sinclair published The Jungle with a character who dreamed of a socialist state. The Jungle also brought the shocking conditions in the Chicago meatpacking industry to the nation's attention. After it was published, the government passed laws to regulate the industry. Muckrakers, added to the mood of dissent and disagreement with the system. These writers raked up the mud and muck, that is, the bad conduct and unfair practices of corporations, government, and society in general. Then they exposed it to the world in the newspaper, or in magazine articles, or in books. Ida Tarbell, for example, wrote about the Standard Oil Company's business practices, and Lincoln Steffens revealed political corruption in American cities. <clears throat> Sweatshops and wobblies. Businesses were looking for ways to produce more goods and make more money. One way, to, one way was to break manufacturing down into series of simple tasks. A worker would no longer make an entire piece of furniture, for example, and said he or she would simply repeat one part of the work. So the worker would do the same task over and over again maybe drilling a hole or squirting glue. This way, companies could hire less skilled labor. Workers became interchangeable, almost like the machines they tended, stripped of individuality and humanity. In New York City, many immigrants went to work in the garment factories called sweatshops. In sweatshops, they worked for very low wages under unhealthy working conditions. They were paid based on how many pieces of clothing they sewed, not on how many hours they worked. Many others did this piecework at home. One of the New York's 500 sweatshops was the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. Women workers that went on strike in the winter of 1909, 20,000 other workers joined them. One striker, Pauline Newman, later recalled the scene. Thousands upon thousands left the factories from every side. It was November. The cold was just around the corner. We had no fur coats to keep warm, and yet there was a spirit that led us on and on. The strike had lasted for months against police, scabs, and arrests, yet although the workers won some of their demands, conditions in the factories did not change much. In March 1911, a fire broke out in the Triangle Building. The fire raged too high in the building for the fire department's ladders to reach it. With workroom doors legally locked by the employers, the workers, mostly young women, were trapped. Some fled the flames by throwing themselves out windows, others burned. When it was over, 146 has died. 100,000 New Yorkers marched in their memorial parade. The union movement was growing, but the biggest union, American Federation of Labor, AFL, did not represent all workers. Its members were almost all white, male skilled laborers. Blacks were kept out of the F AFL. Women made up a fifth of the workforce in 1910, but only one in a hundred women workers was in a union. In addition, AFL officials had begun to seem no better than corporate bosses. They were protected by goon squads who beat up union workers who criticized them. Working people who wanted radical change needed a new kind of union. At a 1905 meeting of anarchists, socialists, and unionists in Chicago, the union was born. It was called the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW. 
and his goal was to organize all workers in any industry into one big union, undivided by sex, race, or skills. The IWW came to be called the Wobblies. Though it's not clear why, the Wobblies were brave, and they were willing to meet force with force. When they struck against the U.S. Steel Company in Pennsylvania in 1909, state troopers came to control the strike. The IWW vowed to kill a trooper for every striker who was killed. Three troopers and four strikers died in one gun battle, but the strikers stayed out until they won. The IWW was inspired by a new idea that was developing in Spain, Italy, and France. This was anarcho-syndicalism. The belief that workers could take power in a country not by seizing control of the government in an armed rebellion, but by bringing the economic system to a halt. The way to stop economic system was to buy was by a general strike, one in which all workers in all the trades and industries would join, united by a common purpose. In ten exciting years after the birth of the IWW became a threat to the capitalist class in the United States, the union never had more than five or ten thousand members at a time, but their ability to organize strikes and protests made a big impact on the country. IWW organizers traveled everywhere. Many of them were unemployed or moved around as migrant workers. They sang, spoke, and spread their message and their spirit. The IWW organizers suffered beatings, imprisonment, and even murder. A criminal case involving organizer Joe Hill gained worldwide attention. Hill was a songwriter whose funny, biting, and inspiring songs made him a legend. For example, his song, The Preacher and the Slave, had a favorite IWW target, the church, as the church was often seen to ignore the very real sufferings of the poor and working classes. The song went, long-haired preachers come out every night, try to tell you what's wrong and what's right. But when asked about something to eat, they will answer with voices so sweet, you will eat by and by in the glorious land above the sky, work and pray, live on hay, you'll get pie in the sky when you die. In 1915, Hill was accused of killing a grocer in Salt Lake City, Utah, during a robbery. There was no direct evidence that he had committed the murder, but there was enough pieces of evidence for a jury to find him guilty. 10,000 people wrote letters to the governor of Utah protesting the verdict, but Joe Hill was executed by a firing squad. Before he died, he wrote to Bill Haywood, another IWW leader, don't waste time, any time in mourning. Organize. Socialism, Sex, and Race Labor struggles were on the rise. In the 1890s, there had been about a thousand strikes a year. By 1904, there were 4,000. Seeing the law and the military take the side of the rich again and again, hundreds of thousands of Americans began to think about socialism. Socialism had gotten its start in the United States in cities and small circles of Jewish and German immigrants. In time, though, it spread and became thoroughly American as many as one million people across the country read socialist newspapers. The Socialist Political Party formed in 1901. Eugene Debs, who had become a socialist after being jailed during a strike, became its spokesman. To Debs, the labor union meant much more than strikes and wages, wage increases. Its goal was to overthrow the capitalist system of private ownership of the tools of labor and achieve the freedom of the whole working class and, in fact, of all mankind. Debs ran for president five times as a socialist candidate. At one time, his party had 100,000 members. The strongest state socialist organization was in Oklahoma, where more than 100 socialists were elected to office. Some of the feminists active in the women's rights movement in the early 20th century were also socialists. They debated challenging questions. If the economic system changed, would women then be full equals in society? Was it better to work toward a revolutionary change in society or to fight for rights within an existing system? Many women were less concerned with social change than with suffrage or the right to vote. As a friendly meeting with the socialist leader Eugene Debs, feminist Susan B. Anthony said, give us suffrage and we'll give you socialism. Debs replied, give us socialism and we'll give you suffrage. Socialists like Helen Keller did not think suffrage was enough. Blind and deaf, Keller fought for change with her spirit and her pen. In 1911, she wrote, Our democracy is but a name. We vote? What does that mean? We choose between Tweedledum and Tweedledee. 
black women face double oppression, held down because of their race as well as their sex. An African-American nurse wrote to a newspaper in 1912, We poor colored women, wage earners in the South, are fighting a terrible battle. On the one hand, we are assailed by black men, who should be our natural protectors. And whether in the cook kitchen, at the wash tub, over the sewing machine, behind the car carriage, or the ironing board, we are little more than pack horses, beasts of burden, slaves. The early part of the 20th century was a low point for African Americans, with lynchings reported every week and murderous race riots in places like Brownsville, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia, the government did nothing. Blacks began to organize in 1905. W.E.B. Du Bois, a respected teacher and author who was sympathetic to the socialists, called black leaders to a meeting in Canada near Niagara Falls. This was the start of a, the Niagara Movement. Five years later, a race riot in Springfield, Illinois, led the founding of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. Whites dominated this new group, and Du Bois was the only black officer. The NAACP focused on education and legal action to end racism, but Du Bois represented the Niagara Movement's strong spirit of activism. The Progressive Movement and the Colorado Coal Strike. Blacks, feminists, labor unions, and socialists saw clearly that they could not count on a national government, and yet history books give the label progressive period to the early years of the 20th century. True, it was a time of, of reforms, but the reforms were made unwillingly. They were not meant to bring about basic changes in society, only to quiet the uprisings of the people. The people got the name progressive because new laws were passed. There were laws for inspecting meat, regulating railroads, controlling the growth of monopolies, and keeping the nation's food and medicine safe. Labor laws set standards for wages an hour. Safe inspection of workplaces and payment of two employees injured on the job were introduced. The U.S. Constitution was changed so that the U.S. Senators were elected directly by vote of the people, not by state legislatures. Ordinary people did benefit from these changes. Basic conditions did not change. However, for the vast majority of tenant farmers, factory workers, slum dwellers, miners, farm laborers, and working men and women, black and white, the government was still dedicated to protecting a system that benefited the upper class. <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt, for example, made a reputation as a trust buster, a politician who opposed monopolies. But two men in the service of multimillionaire J.P. Morgan made private deals with Roosevelt to make sure that trust busting wouldn't go too far. Roosevelt's advisors were industrialists and bankers, not unionists and workers. The progressive movement had some leaders who were honest reformers and others, like Roosevelt, who were only disguised as progressives. In reality, they were conservatives and opposed to do change and concerned with preserving the balance of power and wealth. Both kinds of progressives saw their mission as fending off socialism. They felt that they were improving conditions for the masses. They could prevent what one progressive called the menace of socialism. The Socialist Party was on the rise, and in 1910, Victor Berger became the first socialist elected to the U.S. Congress. In 1911, there were 73 socialist mayors and 1,200 socialists in other city and town offices. Newspapers talked about the rising tide of socialism. The progressives' goal was to save capitalism by repairing its worst problems. In this way, they thought, they could end the growing class war that pitted workers against the economic and political elites. But a strike in Colorado coal miners that began in September 1913 turned into one of the most bitter and violent battles in, the, in that war. After a union organizer was murdered, 11,000 miners went on strike. The Rockefeller family, family, which owned the mine, sent detectives with machine guns to raid the strikers' camps. The strikers fought to keep out strike breakers and to keep the mines from opening. When the governor called on the National Guard troops to destroy the strike, the Rockefellers paid the National Guard's wages. Violent battles, betrayals, and massacres followed. In April 1914, the bodies of 13 children and women were found in a pit, killed by a fire set by National Guardsmen. The, the news spread across the country. Strikes, demonstrations, and protests broke out everywhere. President Woodrow Wilson finally sent in federal troops to crush the strike. 66 men, women, and children 
had died. No soldier or mine guard was charged with a crime. Colorado's ferocious class conflict was felt all over the land. Whatever reforms had been passed, whatever new laws were on the books, the threat of class rebellion remained, and unemployment and hard times were growing. Could patriotism and the military spirit cover up class struggle? The nation was about to find out. In four months, World War I would begin in Europe. That's the end of chapter 13.